Thank you, Father Maximus. This thing's working, is it? It is. All right. Lots of papers, but no paper. You are not going to get a paper from me. Uh, Father mentioned just now dozens of papers. That's right. And I'm done. Uh, some years ago, so I hit my mid-60s, I thought, enough. If I never read another learned article again, it will be too soon. <laughs> I am bored silly by them, and writing them is even worse. So I shan't do it. And so far, I have stuck to that. Father did call me nearly a year ago, was it, or over a year? Please come to this colloquium. I said, no. <laughs> oh, rethink it. No. Then I did. I said, well, OK. <coughs> but with sinking heart, because I realized, of course, I was not going to write something. I was going to talk. So that's what you're going to get today. You're going to get a talk. Father Maximus also sent me an off-print or a copy of an article he wrote on Maximus and the reception of Dionysius the Arapigite. And if I had read that through a year ago or so, I probably would not have come at all. <laughs> because it's quite formidable. And I don't have the answers, at least at the tip of my tongue. What I thought, though, I might do was talk a bit generally about four of the points, at any rate, that I thought warranted attention in that essential critique of my pet. My pet is Dionysius. His pet is Maximus. <laughs> and of course, there is this fact that if Dionysius goes up against Maximus, if anyone goes up against Maximus, they lose. Because he's the gold standard. That won't change. But I do want to defend my pet a bit. So I thought, well, if we look at eschaton or eschatology in the corpus, Dionysiacum, first, then we might look at the question of hierarchy, which, after all, Dionysius invented. That's his word. It doesn't exist in. Uh, the Greek of the late antiquity before him. And then he coins it, and then it's everywhere. Everywhere. It was very popular. He didn't, work, he didn't work coin the word hierarchy, which um, was around. Probably in the, I think, the um, mystery cults and which I am convinced he adopted because it was the closest he could come in the pagan literature to the word archirers, high priest. And why, I think we might come to. By the way, uh, by way of an um, aside, uh, I cannot understand the current orthodox fascination with the word hierarch. Which, where it appears to have replaced, quite simply, the word bishop. One hears about hierarchical liturgies and consulting your local hierarch and the lot. That is recent. It's only about 20, 15, 20 years old. And I think it's because it, they think it sounds more orthodox. <laughs> so I bring up, you know, it's exotic. Yeah? It doesn't sound like the Westerners use. Ha, must be good. Um, but it's not. It's a, it's a substitute, as I said, for high priest. 
And bishop, of course, is a much older word in Christian usage. OK, so eschaton, hierarchy, then the matter of apophysis. There was this terrific quotation from Yaroslav Pelikan in your article, Father, when he speaks about the Maximus rex rescuing Dennis from, what was it, the um, Oh, the nihilistic speculation of apophatic theology. And I thought, wow. Of course, he did no such thing. But never mind, we will talk about apophysis. And then finally, of course, one who has often appeared, said to be the great missing in the Dionysian corpus, uh, Christ. Where is he in all this? And how does he figure? But let's start with eschaton. And um, its presence or non-presence in the Dionysian corpus. And let me, let me begin with an anecdote. Some years ago, uh, a young man who had been my confessee in Milwaukee is the son of the priest and was courting his wife-to-be at the time. He wanted her to become Orthodox because he wanted to be a priest, and he couldn't be a priest if she was not. That's a canon. How do I do that, he said to himself. Well, I'll start by taking her to church. <coughs> And not a churchman when the service is going on, just to a church. So he leads Rebecca into the, this church somewhere in Berkeley. I think I know the one. She'd never been inside one of these. Kind of looks around, frowns, and then a light goes on. Yes, she says. Apocalypse. And I thought, she was just exactly right. Because that is what a church is supposed to be. Apocalypse. The revelation, the unveiling of the divine presence and the kingdom to come. But speaking of apocalypses, this brings us to the Dionysian corpus. And on the face of it, the seemingly strange fact that the whole thing ends. You know, there are 10 epistles that kind of trail off after mystical theology and the current, you know, in the way that it's been set up and handed down, at least since John of Scythopolis. And he came pretty shortly after, one can be certain, uh, its, uh, you know, its apparition. Um, and, the, and the letters are, have, a, have a kind of hierarchical uh, structure. That is, they go from bottom up. They start out with uh, epistles to monks, or therapeutis, borrowing where he uses Philo's word to maintain the pattern of antiquity. Um, <clears throat> then have a deacon, then to a priest, then to a bishop, and then to a monk. Breaking the hierarchical chain, that's Epistle 8, which in fact is a break in the hierarchical chain, because it's about a monk who won't keep his place. And then back to bishop, and then finally, an apostle. John at Patmos. So this is, first of all, an oddity. Because Dennis is writing probably in Syria or Syria-Palestine, certainly an area of the church that would not canonize the apocalypse of John until some time later. And nobody talked about it much. 
at least in the Greek-speaking world. You're going to moderate the question. And the Syrians, even less. Syriac. Athanasius has it in the canon. And he puts that in his fascicle <laughs> letter. But it doesn't get much attention. And here it is, rather prominent. At the end of the Denisian corpus, he thinks it worthwhile ending with a reference to this. And there are a couple of interesting takeaways from this letter. He, he speaks in it of others who here and now are already, easy, are already with God since they are lovers of truth and withdraw from the passion for material things. They depart with complete freedom from every evil and with divine love for every good thing. They love peace and holiness. They abandon this present life by living in a way which is of the life to come like angels in the midst of men with total dispassion, invocation of the divine name, sanctity, and everything else that is good. Well, of course, these sound an awful lot like monks. Uh, these are presumably readers and people interested in John and what John is doing and what Dennis is doing. And he says, finally, I really admire you and I'm carrying on your work. And that kind of, at that point, the mind sort of stutters and says, what? Here you have the only full-blooded apocalypse to make it into the canon of the New Testament. And on the other hand, you have one who is almost universally, or universally, thought to be the most Hellenized, abstract, of all the patristic writers, if we can include him as a patristic writer. How, how does that add up? What's the connection? On the one hand, you have this, well, we'll be generous. We'll say lush iconography. Yes? Swords and cups and, 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 in cubicle cities 1,500 miles on a side, and, 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 and coming down with, with, with uh, flora, trees of life, or fauna, the lamb and the living creatures, and waterworks, the river of life. On the other hand, the prophet of apophysis, yes? <laughs> of negative theology. What's the link? I'm not saying I have the immediate answer to that link, save, but I do think it indicates in him an eschatological interest and an interest in certainly the literature of apocalyptic. <clears throat> We'll come a bit more to that. But first, now, next we need a sort of obstacle, if you will, uh, to the eschatological, is the fact of hierarchy. In fact, it's an obstacle in a lot of ways to a lot of things, or apparent obstacle. Father Maximus, in his article, links it to the ordered sequence of beings in a Neoplatonist cosmos. And it does that, certainly in Proclus and in the Amblicus and so on. In Dennis, well, I guess you could say it works for the angels. It doesn't really work for the ecclesiastical part. You've got the sacred ministers, but they aren't born into those positions. 
In fact, there are all kinds of problems that the ecclesiastical hierarchy represents to a sort of great chain of being. But there's hierarchy itself, which is often seen as a kind of block, a sort of freezing in place of the present order. And part of that, of course, is what he says. You know, the, 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 the percolation of knowledge from the firsts to the seconds to the thirds. To... But as well, our own English, our own sense of how we use that word in English as essentially pecking order. Is that what it means? Is that what it meant for him, for the author of the word? Well, I don't think so. Or at least, I don't think it adequate. So let's go to him. In perhaps the most important statement, I think, in the whole corpus, because it occurs at the beginning, at least as John Oscathopoulos has organized the reading of the corpus, you start with the celestial hierarchy and go on up. Now, this occurs, this passage occurs in Celestial Hierarchy 1, paragraph 3, and reads as follows. It would not be possible for the human intellect to be ordered without immaterial imitation of the heavenly minds, that is, the angels, unless it were to use the material guide that is proper to it. Reckoning the visible beauties as reflections of the invisible splendor, the perceptible fragrances as impressions of the intelligible distribution, the material lights and icon of the immaterial gift of light, the sacred and exclusive teaching, extensive teaching of the scripture, an image of the intellect's intelligible fulfillment, the exterior ranks of the clergy, an image of the harmonious and ordered state, meaning, I, I take it, of the intellect, which is set in order for divine things. And the partaking of the most divine Eucharist in icon of our participation in Jesus Christ. What was he talking about? Pretty clear, yeah? You've got smells, bells, well, you don't have bells, but you have smells, lights, candles, scripture teachings, clergy, Eucharist. It's a liturgy. Yeah? And I submit that the primary sense for him of hierarchy is liturgy, organized, structured worship. The worship which, moreover, is revealed it's not just something they cooked up. It's revealed, first of all, in Exodus. He refers to that in Ecclesiastical Hierarchy 5, 1 and 2. E katanomon hierarchia. Literally, the hierarchy according to the law. But that's, you know, what's in Moses. That's Exodus 25 following and the revelation of the tabernacle the pattern and its orders for its construction, as well as the vestments of the high priest and other clergy. And he said, that's the, that's the shadow. And now we have the icon, borrowing from Hebrews, distinction between shadow and image. Now we have the icon, and moreover, it's an acrivis icon the exact image. Note that the apophatic approach attaches everything in Dionysius except the liturgy. It's never applied there. <coughs> that will bring me to Well, 
It will bring me to apophysis, but by way of one more remark about the architecture of the ecclesiastical hierarchy, the treatise. What goes on? What's the beginning? What's the middle? What's the end? You start out with baptism. Lakshmi, I think you have an introductory chapel, chapel where you, chapter where you're setting up things. But then you start out with baptism that starts outside the doors of the church, right? Find your, you find your perspective, perspective catechumen, and you bring him in the doors to the porch, where he makes his sense. Oh, it's all kind of taken as one swoop, yes? One progressive motion from outside the doors up to, up to the altar, and the communing of the baptizand after baptism. Then the next one is the liturg is the Eucharist, which oddly doesn't come as a sort of you know, center of the piece. He says it's the teleti teleton. It's the it's the rite of rites. It's the uh, it's the biggie, but it's not put there. I think that's to touch on these matters of motion. You have a straight motion in the baptism kind of. Outside, right up, right up to the innermost point of the church. Then you have in the in the Eucharist a kind of series of pulses going out from the altar, the bishop's initial sense of the whole church, then the lesser procession of the gospel, and then finally a focus on the altar. In the anaphora, which word is you're right, Father Max, he doesn't use. Um, but he essentially talks about the content, and he says, the bishop brings into sight the things hymned. I take that as a reference to consecration, but some may argue. <clears throat> and then the communing of the faithful. And then finally, the middle, the kind of climax of what amounts to a sort of ingressus ad altari day, is a very typically Syrian sacrament, the miron. He doesn't mean the anointing. He means the confection of the oil which anoints, which anoints both the human temple to be, the, the, bapt, uh, the one being baptized, and the altar, to make it altar. So it's a focus on the altar. The heavenly locus. We never move outside the altar. And in the process of that focus, he says of the altar, the theurgy, meaning the work, the work of God, which always means the incarnation, transcends the heavens and is superessential. It is the origin, essence, and perfecting power of all our divinely worked sanctification. For if our demo, the most divine altar is Jesus, who is both the divine consecration of the heavenly intelligence, and he in whom we, according to the saying, being at once consecrated and in mystery wholly consumed, literally, he says, become whole burnt offerings. Olo kavtomini, have our access to God. <coughs> Let us gaze with supramundane eyes on this most divine altar, that is, Christ, by whom all that is being perfected is perfected and sanctified, made perfect by him who is himself also that most divine altar. <coughs> Now, why I bring this in, this note of architecture, and then, of course, everything flows out. You start moving down in the, uh, in the ordination, the, the chapter 5, which is the ordination of the sacred ministers, bishop, priests, deacons, 
And then the tonsure of monks, chapter 6. And finally, you go out the doors with a whole chapter developed to funerals. He's the only one I does, does. But it serves a purpose. Because as I said, it takes you out the doors. Because here's order, and here's meaning, and here's structure in a world that is chaotic with the fall. It's a church. You enter into order and meaning through baptism. But obviously, too, you have to leave in this world. You're going to die. And so he spends a whole chapter defending the role of the body, that it's going to share in the resurrection by gum. It's done, though, it's done work with the soul. OK, so it shares the reward. Sin athlisanda. Yes? It exercised with the, with the soul, so it gets its reward, too. The ecclesiastical hierarchy does not work unless you've got a resurrection in there somewhere. <coughs> so neither does the whole corpus work unless you've got an eschaton then. <coughs> and the eschaton, well, let's go by virtue of way, uh, let's go by way of a matter of apophysis. That's, and here I've got a quotation from an old friend and acquaintance, um, Andrew Louth, who had a very useful six set of lectures um, from, I think it's Southern Missouri University. Uh, called The Wisdom of the Byzantine Church. There are lectures on Evagrius, Ponticus, and Maximus Confessor. Very good in its typical lucid style. And this is a passage from, on Maximus, the adaptation of the ecclesiastical hierarchy. An interesting, Louth is talk, starts out by talking about Apophysis in Maximus' language. What the apophatic language is here giving expression to is, first of all, an experience. Not a matter of information or concepts. It is a matter of encounter. This is an ecclesial encounter, an encounter in the vision of God with the church, and thus with the soul. Is that in vision, I think? It's, oh, in union of God, in union with God, sorry. With the church, and thus with the soul. What am I speaking of? In fact, of apophatic theology, as Maximus envisages it, when he speaks of the soul as a church made without hands. It is the realization in the Christian soul of what is accomplished and celebrated in the church's liturgy that leads Maximus to draw on the language of apophatic theology. In other words, what Maximus, St. Maximus' great thing is, as it were, to place the mystical theology, Dinus's apophatic, yes, treatise, into the middle of the ecclesiastical hierarchy. Bravo, Maximus. Except, I think, Dionysius had already done that. But this wasn't St. Maximus's contribution that he, I'm pretty sure he had a sense of it already there. And how can I say that? Well, let's turn to the mystical theology, <coughs> which, by the way, is another, well, it's not a word, it's a phrase, that I think 
and we have Dionysus to thank for. I don't think the phrase mystical theology is around until he coins it. Because in Greek, in Greek of the time, it sounds kind of funny. Five minutes, huh? I don't think we're going to get there. I think we're going to run a little over. Um, but I'll try to hurry it up so I won't have to drop my Macarius. Um, <coughs> where was I? Thanks. Mystical theology. Oh. Yeah, it sounds a little funny. Uh, you know, the word mystical, like in modern Greek, just meant hidden. Didn't have any uh, religious sense to it, just hidden. When Origen's talking about the mystical meaning of Christ, he means, he usually means Christ. Uh, hidden in the, uh, in the Old Testament where it's present in the Old Testament words. So we have a hidden theology. What the hell is a hidden theology? Well, here we have the different senses of theology in Christian Greek. And it means a lot of things. If you open up the lamp, you, know, you open up Little and Scott, the classical, the theology is about that big. It means theogony or um, a philosophical discourse about divinity. But that's just a base meaning, a base meaning in the use of, in the Christian use of the term. OK, so it means that. Then you go up a level, and it means scripture. That's the theology, a locution that Dionysius uses all the time. And then go up another notch, and it means um, doxology, glorification, worship, the worship of the church in heaven and on earth. That's theology. Then you go up another notch, and it means the visio dei, the vision or experience of God. And still another notch, and it means trinity. So one sense of this might mean hidden trinity. It starts out, you know, with a, an encomium uh, to the trinity, tria si perfea. Uh, but, but by the time it winds down to the end, you've got him saying, but God isn't this, that, the other, the other, the other. He isn't fatherhood like we understand, or spirit as we understand, or sonship as we understand. He's beyond all of these limitations and free. That's how it ends. That's how the mystical theology ends. So you're thinking, well, wait a minute, what's the Trinity? Where's the Trinity? What? What? Where's Trinity? Where's Jesus? Who isn't mentioned at all. Um, and um, yes, where is it? Where is it? Well, I think the answer comes in what follows. Because, you know, the treatise, the corpus doesn't end there. Then you got these epistles trailing off. And the, there are five of the first five are of significance to us. And I've argued elsewhere that they, they're a kind of chiasm. You've got an A, pri an a and an A prime, a B and a B prime, and then C that ties them all together. The A prime's about the darkness. The theme of the darkness of unknowing that we've encountered in the mystical theology is repeated. And in Epistle 1, and then in Epistle 5, the darkness is redefined as quoting 1 Timothy 6.16, as the unapproachable light within which God is said to dwell and in which those who have entered into the gnophos, the cloud, 
of Sinai have also entered. And he speaks specifically of David and Paul. By the way, I think there's a po possible reference you're bringing up, 2 Corinthians 12, not mentioned in Dennis. I think that might be a possible allusion. Um, <clears throat> so Paul has seen this unapproachable light, has experienced it in the divine gnophos. It's not darkness. He, elsewhere, he does it again in divine names, identifying the gnophos with the aprositon force of the divine presence. What, what both of them actually are pointing to is the darkness of the holy of holies. This is temple language, which is at the same time superabundant light, because that is, there is the divine presence, the Shekinah. Epistles um, 2 and 4 take up the gift of light, what we would call deification, and include in Epistle 4 the famous uh, a certain theandric activity. which I think refers to what Jesus, our Lord, gives us. It's pepolite menos. Kenintina feandrikina nergen. And I suggest pepolite menos might be taken in deponent sense, as is possible, meaning administer to. But that's just a suggestion. But the key, what ties these lines together and answers the question that we were left at the end, with at the end of the mystical theology, is Epistle 3, which starts with the word exephnis. Suddenly. And our writer says, exephnis means that which comes forth from the hitherto invisible and beyond hope into manifestation. And I think that here the scripture, literally the theology, is suggesting the philanthropy of Christ. The superessential has proceeded out of its hiddenness to become manifest to us by becoming a human being. But he's also hidden, both after the manifestation and to speak more divinely even within it. For this is the hidden of Jesus, and neither by rational discourse nor by intuition can his mystery be brought forth, but instead even when spoken remains ineffable, when conceived with the intellect, unknowable. So here's the reprise of the themes, unknowability and ineffability, transcendental hiddenness and revelation, the sacramental echo in the mysterion of the incarnation, Christ is the sacrament, both at the center and terminus of the divine processions to us and to our world, and simultaneously the vehicle and goal of our return. And this word exephnis has a history. Now, of course, if you look in the, in the um, apparatus, in the critical text, which is wonderful, but it, it misses some things. So now I have exephnis, then they'll cite, oh, OK, Parmenides, yes. Symposium, yes. Uh, Plato's third epistle, yes, yes, yes. Then they'll have, you know, something from Plotinus, da, 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 da. Nothing from scripture. Nothing. Zip. Which is significant. Because these are good Christians making these, you know, things like uh, Dr. Ritter, Professor Ritter, Sir Heil there. They know they're good Lutherans, like all the founders of patristic literature, or of patristic studies, not literature, uh, and biblical studies, and everything else we do. So I get tired of learned papers, right? We're all playing at being Germans. All right. <clears throat> and most of us can't do it as well as they did. So. No Bible. But there are important appearances of this word in Bible, in New Testament. It occurs twice in reference to St. Paul's getting knocked off his horse on the way to Damascus. 
by the light, suddenly, bam, falls off. It, it refers to the revelation of the angels to the shepherds in the fields outside Bethlehem, and suddenly, there's the heavenly chorus, the heavenly liturgy, yes. Our Lord refers to it in his eschatological discourse in, Ma in Mark 13. And be, beware, therefore, keep watch, lest suddenly the master come at midnight. And you'll be found wanting, of course. And then there's an Old Testament reference. Malachi 3.1, a reference to the coming of Messiah and the beginning of the end. And suddenly, the angel of divine counsel will appear in the temple. Which is what John of Scythopolis cites for this passage in Dionysius. But he doesn't get it all quite right. He gets it, you know, temple, yeah, church, yeah. So it ties together the Eucharistic element. What he doesn't get is the inner thing, the inner, the inner thing. This is part of the inner change, that altar within, which I probably failed to mention, which I failed to mention. That's why I should have had Macarius. In talking about hierarchy, there's always an inner and an outer to it. It's an inner development, an inner change. And here is Christ, not only the altar of the church, but the altar of the heart in light. The eschatological presence. Which I think ties up the points I wanted to make. Ah! And right on time. Oh, there you are.